So, um, my name is uh, Max, and I will give you a little a little talk about um, the essential R libraries. Um, and I want to preface that this is going to be a very very biased talk because this was well kind of a my my personal selection. Um, so let's start off very very briefly. Who am I? I'm actually a chemist uh, slash physicist, so I come from natural sciences. Um, and after, I st my, after my studies, I started working at a startup where I did some business intelligence work. And after the, where I realized I actually want to do data science. So I applied at a steel trading company. And ever since, which is a kind of a half a year ago, I started working uh, with R. I had some previous programming experience in the standard, um, well, academic programming stack, which is comprised of C, C++, and of course, Fortran 77 because we don't like object-oriented programming. Um, yeah, and so this is, this is all about me. The first, the first thing we have to clear is uh, why this talk. Um, I believe that or, all of you who work in data science uh, have probably realized that we're spending 80% of our time on data wrangling, just fetching data, getting data into the, into the right form, and after that we can spend the rem reminder of the 20% um, in order to do some, some actual modeling, some intellectually straining and interesting work. And this is the reason why I believe that, um, that efficiency, is, efficiency in this context is kind of important. Um, and in the context of R, there is, R has this one specificity, as the same as Python. The R and Python communities are huge. They are immensely huge. I don't think that you will you will find other uh, communities that are, that are as large and as huge, and where there are so many um, packages around. Um, CRAN hosts about seven thousand well maintained, well maintained L and well documented packages. That means please refrain from 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 reinventing the the wheel if you're working with R. Because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are actually Teslas driving around. You just, you just need to find them. And this is basically the reason um, why I wanted to give this talk. Because, um, yeah, you can be much more efficient if you just know what's there. But this is due to the, 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 the sheer size of the community and the amount of packages. That's no easy task. And kind of half-jokingly, I put this, this, this very... Um, this, this XKCD comic here, which shows uh, how much time we can actually shave off um, if, you, if, you, if you shave off some time over a, for a task that you're doing repetitively. Okay, so, um, first of all, so well, what, yeah, so this is basically the, the, the most important, um, I, hope, I hope you can read, can you read that sure. from the very end? Yeah, okay. Um, so what, what do we have at our disposal? First of all, um, R Studio. R Studio is a great IDE. Um, IPython notebooks, Jupyter notebooks are, are awesome, um, but I believe R Studio has, has even more power insofar as it integrates beautifully with uh, Shiny apps. Um, it provides a, its, its own markdown language. It also provides means for reporting and creating presentations. And I created this presentation also. Um, with our studio and, um, and the tools that came with it. So our studio itself is something worth looking into. Um, aside from our studio, there, is, there are some packages that, are, that constitute the so-called tidyverse, which are mainly authored by Hadley Wickham, who is probably um, well known to the, to the, in the R community. Um, he has written, for example, DeepLire, which we will come to later on. DeepLire is the go-to um, library for, for all operations, um, for, for all data frame um, operations. On the other hand, you have, you have Tidier. Um, this is also something defined by Hadley Wickham um, that data should, should exist in a tidy format. You have the next, but you have the package for that. Um, if, you, if you do anything string-related, sophisticated string operation, then you go to Stringer. Aside from that, if you ever had to work with dates and especially time zones, time zones, you know that this can be a huge pain. For that, you have, for example, Lubridate. And of course, already mentioned by Klaus, um, you have ggplot, which is, um, I believe, to plotting what LaTeX is to, to typesetting and, and absolutely important. 
Um, so th th those packages are, are, the, are the core of the tidyverse. There are some more, but I don't want to um, go into further detail here. Um, aside from, from the tidyverse, you have, for example, um, Shiny. Shiny itself um, is a framework that allows you to, to create web applications, interactive web applications, just very similar to, to, to what uh, Klaus showed you uh, a couple of minutes ago. I will show examples of that later on. And something I personally found um, extremely helpful recently is a package called Diagrammer. I'll give you an example later on as well, uh, which allows you to, to define flowcharts by using ASCII text. And if any one of you ever tried to do a flowchart, a large flowchart, where he realized he needs to input something at a central position, knows that it, this can be a huge pain. It's kind of like messing with Word and, and um, including a, a, a graphic at the very end, which messes up the whole layout. So, using 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 programs that take care of you with the, with the of the layout are really helpful. And aside from that, um, some packages like Magrid. We'll talk about that. YAML is also quite interesting because um, that is a, a data serialization framework. And the cool thing about YAML is um, it's absolutely cross language, cross system. So if you have YAML for Python, for R, for C, for any language for Erlang, for Go, for Julia, for literally any language. So if you have to exchange um, smaller amounts of data um, from one language to import it to another one, use YAML. I personally use it for all my config files because there are super easy interfaces. Also, unit testing, if you have to unit test, use TestDat, also authored by, by, by Hadley Wickham. Um, if you, I personally, I'm kind of a color geek. I really, really like when we're plotting um, to using the right colors, and there's uh, our color brewer for that. And the last thing I also show, show an example uh, for that is Profis, is profiling our code, because this is something absolutely necessary, because it is very easy to write messy and slow R code, and you need to, to, to find out what is the slow and, and, well, find the remedy for the, for the bottlenecks. So please take this take this slide as a, something for for future reference. If you ever um, find find yourself in a t tackling a problem that has to do, for example, with dates or something, and refer to this slide. Okay, and what we will cover today is Magrid, Dplyr, Shiny, Profvis, and Diagrammer, depending on, on on what the time and the audience allows. Okay, um, I will use two two exemplary data sets uh, for, the, for the next examples. The first one is the iris data sets. Um, it has some information on the sepal and petal uh, dimensions of uh, three flowers, the iris, setosa, versicular, and, and, and the third one. And the other one will be the MTCARS um, standard data set, um, which is comprised of um, some car stacks. Okay, so let's start off with uh, Magrid. Um, this actually occurred to me uh, why this is necessary during your talk, talk class, because in, in Python you have this beautiful object-oriented program way of programming where everything is an object and has its attributes and its methods and you can apply them to this, to this object by just chaining them with the dots. Well, in our object-oriented programming is, is, is um, implemented slightly, slightly different, it's basically a better naming convention. and. Um, this leads to the fact that in R you can write code either this way, which is a very nested, the, the simple nested approach, which leads to code that you have to read from the inside to the outside. So first you filter. Um, this is enclosed by a summarize function with uh, with uh, some argument, and then in the end you arrange. So that actually the last function calls at the top. So this is suboptimal for commenting, for reading, for comprehension. Don't do that, but you have to sometimes. Okay, the, the slightly better approach is the sequential approach, where you simply assign intermediate results to um, dummy variables or some intermediate variables. Um, problem with that is, if you want to comment something out, um, then this code won't work anymore. You would have to you, you would have to change something, um, and also you at some point you will you will run out of meaningful dummy variable names. Therefore, there is um, Magrid, this program, uh, this this library. And it lent its name from, 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 well, this painting by Magritte, which says, this is not a pipe, because this is obviously the image of a pipe. And um, in this case, 
it's this it's this operator that it that it incorporates that allows for chaining and piping um, the output of one function to another. So in that case, that means what I can do now is basically the same what what in Python you do with this dot operator where you chain um, the uh, subsequent functions with each other. So in this case, I'm taking the empty cars, I'm, I'm piping it to filter, then I'm summarizing, and then I'm arranging. So now this 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 flow is the flow is exactly the same as you would read it top down, and uh, this is a much more readable. This yields much more readable code, and this part, uh, this 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 library actually provides um, some some other more exotic um, operators. But this one is most certainly the the most important one. There is also a shortcut in, in R Studio for that, and this was actually only introduced in 2014, and, and was kind of a revolution simply because the code was messier before, and this made it um, much much clearer. Of course, you can you can you can change the position where you want to have the uh, argument just by using using the dot. So you, there's still full flexibility maintained. Okay, so we have uh, Magritte covered the pipe. Now let's have a look um, a brief look at Dplyr since some people already know it, but not all of you. Um, Dplyr provides a complete framework for manipulating data frame. That's what the D in Dplyr stands for. So you have basically seven verbs. Um, you have a select, which selects simply columns. You can filter rows, you can group by, you can summarize, you can add columns by mutate. Of course, you can arrange and then you can, you can join. And there are two approaches. The one is the non-standard evaluation approach and the standard evaluation approach in every case. And um, the difference I want to highlight um, with the select function. So, in base R, you would subset a, a data set just like that with the, subs with the subset operator, the, the, the bracket. Um, whereas in dplyr, you're simply, you don't have to pipe, but in this case, I always uh, pipe it into the, um, the, the data set, into the function, and you don't have to, and this is exactly what non-standard evaluation means, you don't have to use uh, quotation marks anymore, you just pass um, the names of the, of the columns you wish to have, you wish to select. And in the in the standard evaluation case, you still have to you still have to do that. But uh, the standard evaluation case is usually used if you want to construct the column names you want to subset. There you go. Okay. And what actually means select is, is is nothing too fancy. However, what is actually cool about select is it works with uh, some helper function, for example, with uh, matches that actually provides a. Um, a, where you can provide a regular expression or for example starts with or ends with which is kind of helpful because very often you, you just uh, put a prefix or a suffix before or after a column, na column name um, to discern that something happened before or after and then, and then you can easily select that. Okay, um, filtering, filtering works um, pretty much uh, the same. Um, I want, I'm, I'm gonna skip over that for now. And of course, grouping. Uh, Klaus, because you, you actually took, took it away, kind of. It's it's literally the same grouping and summarizing and just collapsing the whole data frame to one single uh, row and calculating some some metric. In this case, the mean of the sepal length and the, and the standard deviation. And here we would see the, the the result. And mutate is pretty much the same. You can simply um, add with the same syntax. And the muted function, you can add the sum of the petal dimensions. Now, and if you put it all together, um, you can, for example, first mute it and then set for the for the empty cars. Um, you can set, uh, you can define a efficient and inefficient category depending on the the mileage the cars get. Um, you can, of course, then group by again by both levels, the efficiency category and the number of cylinders. You can summarize that and arrange, and what you get is, is actually a data frame where you can see that the efficient cars usually have four cylinders and rather low, rather low average horsepower, whereas the inefficient ones are, of course, rising. So this is basically dplyr. Now, some of you might know the, the other package, which is kind of a competitor, which is called the data table. Um, and I was always wondering, what, what, what is the difference? And this is what I would like to highlight now in the next slide. 
Now, there's usually a question which one's better. You can find a lot of threads in Stack Overflow uh, asking exactly that. And the point is, they are following very, very different philosophies. That means uh, DeepLayer uses those very verbose verbs, uh, whereas Data Table has a more convoluted, rather base R syntax, where, uh, which is depicted here. So take the Data Table and subset rows using this argument I, and then calculate J group by this by argument. So this is just different syntax. However, there are very important differences because Dplyr is much, much less memory efficient. Because simply it's memory inefficient. That means um, it always creates a deep copy of your whole data set. So if you're using if you're working with bigger data, and by bigger data I mean data that reaches um, your your uh, the RAM, um, the memory, the accessible memory in your computer system, then you would probably want to use a data table because you can only use data sets that are half the size of your memory. Um, so this is the first, this is the first uh, very important difference. And the second one is that data table works kind of like a database. That means it also has indexes. And for data sets that are larger than, than let's say, a million rows, um, subsetting becomes with data table drastically faster. So this is where dplyr cannot compete anymore. And this is where the, the point where you would definitely um, yeah, switch dplyr for data table. So it's good to know that um, data table is there and, and, and will be more, more efficient. OK, so um, who of you knows, knows Shiny, Shiny applications? OK, a couple of people as well. So let's go rather quickly over that. Um, I have, what I want to actually to show is, is that it's incredibly easy with Shiny to create interactive uh, web applications. And uh, something very similar to what you showed before, Klaus, um, with, with, with those sliders. And I just want to show how easy that actually is. So I got disconnected from the server. So this is a Shiny app that actually consists, this is from the Shiny gallery, which, which uh, provides some, some examples. And the whole code for this, for this, what you see above is this and this. So this is basically a 30 lines of, codes, uh, of code. And you have this k-means clustering of the iris data set where you can interactively, interactively select um, the x and y variables and, for example, the class, cluster counts. And interactively, it, it, it just updates. Um, I, I personally find it incredibly remarkable um, that you can do something, the interactivity especially, with, with so, little, so little code and it's actually very, very easy to grasp. Okay, so that was Shiny. And now to something actually completely different. Um, I, I mentioned before, um, in R it's kind of easy to write um, inefficient non-performant code that is simply very, very slow. And you will have a problem, try, uh, uh, kind of, it's always a problem to, to finding those bottlenecks and, and finding out, um, and yeah, well, finding a remedy for them. And I want to show an example um, how this could be, can be done, can be, can be easily uh, remedied with, with this Profvis uh, library. So what, what do we have here? I have prepared this example of where you have a data frame with uh, 150 columns and 40,000 rows. And what, what, what I'm going to do is I'm, pro, I'm going to profile uh, three different ways of, of calculating the mean. And so if you run this code in, in, in our studio, you will get the following. You will get this. This is a little bit too much zoomed in. That was perfect. Okay, so what you see here is, I'm gonna use the mouse. Um, you can see here on, the, on, on this side, the memory used by each line of code and the time it took to, to execute the line of code. So um, remember we had a data frame and uh, in the first case, I'm using an apply function to calculate the mean along the columns. This, this is what the two stands for and the function is of course calculating the mean. So the memory it took, 1.5 gigabytes and it took one second. And now the nice thing is, as you can see down here, um, everything is highlighted. This line of code is highlighted down here. So first when you call apply, what is first called um, is as matrix. That means that this data frame is, is um, 
is how do we call it? If, uh, yeah, it, it is a, a matrix is made out of the out of the data frame, um, and then a unlist follows. After which um, the apron function, which simply transponses the matrix, is applied, and only after that you apply the 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 function which ca calculates the mean. So you're spending a lot of time doing things that simply have to do with your with your date uh, data format. Okay, so in the second in the second case, I apply the call means function, which is a little bit quicker. But however, it still has to uh, it, ha it still has to create a matrix out of the data frame. And in the third case, we simply use the write function for the write job, and that is l apply, which is applied to lists and returns a list. And the data frame is actually just um, a couple of lists strung together. And as you can see, this is this is by far the the, the most efficient way to do things. And yeah, this is pretty much the example I wanted to show you. And with that, I want to actually close with, with uh, what I mentioned before, Diagrammer, which is a great tool um, for flowcharting. Because, it, for example, it's, it's basically a wrapper for two different languages. The one is GraphVis and the other one is called Mermaid. Um, and it allows you to just, for example, in this case, I use some mermaid code, um, which what we're all, the only thing you have to do is define your nodes and the connection between the nodes, and uh, and, and and the layouting is is taken care of by by um, diagrammer. So no problem. So this is this is something I found extremely helpful because you can you can create huge flowcharts that are that are always working, and you never have to take care of of. This was what, what I wanted to mention as well. Um, we don't have to write anything; we will put it on our homepage. So, so we have picture on your homepage. Sorry. And we have picture on your homepage. On our homepage. Oh, when right. a data science group. Yeah. So vtsj. Dot i. Dot at. Questions. Questions. Or was it completely here? <laughs> completely here. But then a, a question from, from, from my side. Because uh, you asked who who was who is using Pyth uh, you who is using R. I, I would be interested in, and I think you, you didn't ask who is using Python here. Also roughly how sir? Uh, Sir. Okay, so I think this resembles a bit the, the general um, situation. What I read always, um, what is widely used uh, for data science. On the one hand, Python. On the one, on the other hand, R. Uh, did you use uh, Python as well? Yes, I did. So why why are you at the moment not uh, doing Python mainly? Because it's usually not not only the not not, not only the programmer's choice to, to use the language he, he he likes. So in this case, I was simply there was uh, the system was already built in R, and then well, it's kind of hard to, to choose your job by the language you wanna you wanna practice, especially in data science, I guess, in Austria. So you <laughs> have to. Data science in Austria, come on. <laughs> And uh, maybe maybe the same question to to Klaus shortly. Yeah, what we are primarily using Python at work, um, but also R, so it actually depends. Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, work with both, and but I think most of my colleagues are using uh, Python. Why do you use one versus the other? What what decides in the project? Um, but I think for if you're doing uh, statistics on a very high level, I would say that R is is and I would say always will be the standard, especially for any academic research. Uh, I don't think their Python will ever <laughs> replace R with respect to, to statistics on a very high level. But otherwise, um, I personally prefer Python for its its cleaner style. Actually, so it, uh, it just feels better, <laughs> and that's uh, when you spend a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes a difference. Is it higher performing in general? I mean, I know 
know you gave profile ways, but R has the reputation of being slow. No, it, it is. It, it, it most certainly is slow. And if you want R to be fast, you, you, you're going to write your, the, the core, at least the core of your library or your function in C, which is, well, okay. But, but I, if I wanted to, to, to write C, I wouldn't choose R. Um, but that's, that's, that's what you would do, probably. And this is also the problem with R, with R because in Python you know libraries, and in Python you can read that, you can comprehend it. In R it's, it's, it's of course, then the compiled uh, C code, and then you're, you're an R programmer, not a C programmer. So it's gonna, it's, I, I believe that's kind of a limit to the, to the language itself, and to the, to, the, um, to the question you asked before. I also think that Python is, is, is a much clearer and, and, and more concise language and if you're coming from, from an actual programming background, you probably want to resort to Python. Whereas if you come from the, from the statistical, more hacky background, just want to get things done quickly and not care about what happens under the hood, go, to, go, go for R. Maybe just an additional note. Uh, I think that sooner or later every, every project grows. And in my opinion, uh, it's easier to develop and maintain uh, Python projects. But it's just a personal opinion. And maybe a uh, very last remark if you're using both Python and R, there's the Feather package, which is uh, developed by uh, Hedley Wickham and Wes McKinney, where you can, um, uh, like, let's say, yeah, use data frames basically. It's an HDF file. But you can read um, two pandas data frames and two R data frames, read and write. So this is quite nice if you want to. Use both and exchange data, which is not that trivial, actually. I want to dominate, sorry. Um, so, dominate. Um, <laughs> if you're not actually doing the analysis on your own machine, but want to use one of the cloud service providers, what's out there for using Python with Azure or with, 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 with Google or with AWS? I know there is this uh, Microsoft has just started a, a, a R cloud, um, which I, I I haven't used it myself, but I, uh, I I stumbled across it and it seems to be rather performant. But aside from that, it's hard for me to say so. Um, I also want to want to underline that um, maybe I'm sure somebody noticed uh, Microsoft bought Revolution R quite some time ago and they didn't uh, do it for fun, but they are now basically uh, very, very heavily uh, promoting the capabilities of, for example, the SQL Server um, doing R code in database, which, uh, which addresses some of the performance, is performance issues you, uh, you just talked about. Also, the, the um, cloud infra infrastructure Azure is, uh, is now capable of, uh, of running our code and so on and so forth. So they really put their 800 pound gorilla um, weight on that. But this is also just something I, I know. Um, and for Python, I'm, I'm not sure. All major cloud services. So then, then for me, because performance was was something which which came up quite quite some time. Does anybody here in the room use Julia? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't know the second. Thing. <laughs> just uh, just mentioning. Um, if you have never never heard of it. Um, it's a quite young language, spe specifically uh, addressing these performance um, issues with R, uh, developed by, by MIT, I think five years, very dynamically, and one of our, just saying, Rene today is not here, but the uh, Julia Mita um, founder in Vienna is one of our members, so I have to promote Julia. But it's really cool and very performant. Okay. Further questions? 
So then, then I, I just wanted to thank you.